We now remember. Uh, no, I knew it was coming. I got, I just, all right. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm an ace. I'm Gerald. I'm Andy. And this week we're discussing Hot Eyes by Stuart Dybeck. If you haven't read the story yet, there's a link in the show notes. This story is on the longer side, but it's worth the indulgence of quiet reading time. Hot Ice is divided into sections with a topic title for each. And because it's a long story, I'm going to use it as a summary guide. Um, but it's worth it. Yeah. So the first Ooh. section is Saints. In it, three friends, Eddie Capusta and brothers, Pancho and Manny Santora, discuss the story of a girl who had drowned in the Park Lagoon about 30 years earlier during World War II. According to the story, her father found her body and traveled with it on a streetcar to an ice house near the Cook County Jail. Her body is rumored to still be frozen there and to have special magical powers. Big Antec, a local drunk, claims that um, he once locked himself in the meat locker of a butcher shop where he worked and the girl's frozen body that was temporarily stored there kept him alive through the weekend. The next section, Amnesia, begins with Pancho already having left the neighborhood because he's in jail. So Manny visits him three times a week, but Pancho eventually asks him to quit coming because he doesn't want to be reminded of the outside world. Eddie and Manny walk to the Cook County Jail where Pancho is being held, and they walk around to shouting Pancho's name. The next section is grief. Pancho has disappeared while in jail with no definitive explanation of where he has gone. So there's a bunch of rumors, suicide, murder, a prison break. Some people claim to have seen him walk in the streets or in church. He's become a legendary figure. That it's Easter week. Eddie and Manny haven't seen each other since Christmas. Now on the Tuesday before Easter, Eddie goes to Manny's house. They go to the jail where Manny taunts the inmates. inmates. He calls them racial slurs. He's like, I'm sleeping with your wife. I'm sleeping with your girlfriend. So then the uh, inmates start shouting for them to shut up. The um, guards turn on their searchlights. They call the police. They flee. Um, then the next night on Ash Wednesday, Manny again shouts the same stuff. Again, searchlights and sirens drive them away. The next se section is nostalgia. Maundy Thursday. We're holy weekend it up. Um, they take drugs and they walk around the city. They pass by an open fire hydrant where Manny can, uh, can smell Lake Michigan. And it reminds him of when his family would go um, fishing for smelt, which is a tiny silvery fish. Mm -hmm. Eddie, doesn't, yeah. Eddie doesn't know about smelt, so they take the bus to the lake. Then they take amphetamines all night long, then some quaaludes, the sun comes up, now it's Good Friday. Manny remembers this ritual that Poncho made up of going to seven church services on Good Friday. Poncho's very religious. Um, so he does this, he does his brother's made up Good Friday seven church thing. Uh, Eddie goes with him, but is less engaged. Now we're in the final section, Legends. Eddie and Manny approach Big Antic. They're all laughing. Everyone's in a good mood, but they start making fun of the story of the frozen girl. Remember, Big Antic's the one who believes in her powers because he believes it saved his life. So the ice house is about to get demolished where the girl's body is supposed to um, still be entombed in ice. So Eddie and Manny break in. Big Antic's outside. They break in, they find her, and they put her on an old-timey hand car on the railroad tracks that lead to the lake, and they decide they're going to go release her into the lake where she will be finally released from the ice. All right, that's the story. Yeah, long summary. That's cool. Yeah. So, let's start with Andy, because he looks eager to talk about how much he loved his story. Yeah, well, first off, I hated the story. Why? Uh, it was just dumb and pretentious and what? flamboyantly like, blah, blah, blah. That's what it was. It's <laughs> Just like, like that. I don't know. Hold on. When you say pretending first... to be more artistic than it is. Wow. There's nothing there underneath. I didn't care Whoa. for it, but I did have a great time reading it. Uh huh. Um, as the story of a Polish Catholic boy growing up in Chicago, whose friends are Hispanic Catholics. It resonated deeply with me. <clears throat> As I was, in fact, a Polish Catholic boy growing up in Chicago whose friends were all Hispanic Catholics. Because that, you stick together. Uh -huh. Although, my family was from Jefferson Park. So that's different. And where are these people? Douglas like Park. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, what do you think about those so Douglas Park Catholics? So, well, so no, it's, it's, it's <laughs> a bunch of like class divides 
Mm-hmm. Right, Douglas Park is south side and Jefferson Park's north side. Oh, that's so you're fancy. You're a fancy park. Right. Well, right. Um Well, middle class, Jefferson. Well, so right? they talk a lot about DPs in the story, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. stands for dumb Pollocks. No, that's not what it stands for. No. Nope. Uh, that's what my grandma that's... says it stands for. I mean, she can get away with it because she's Polish, but I think it's displaced persons. Yeah. Yeah. That's what my grandma says it stands for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why would she say it's dumb Pollocks if she herself is? Uh, because that's for first generation immigrants. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's what they do. That's mm-hmm. what they do. A bit of self loathing. Right. Because. Right. Multi generational immigrants settled earlier on in the mm-hmm. now more affluent or at least upper middle class north side, mm-hmm. and new immigrants are coming in to the less affluent south side. Got it. Mm-hmm. I get that too with uh, the early Cubans versus the later Cubans. Yep. The correct and the incorrect, basically just because of time. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. So I don't know if anyone followed that, but. <laughs> All right. So you're saying that you thought the story had no substance and you didn't care, but you had fun reading it because of your own personal connections to it. Yeah. Oh, man. We used to go smelt fishing all the time every okay. summer until the so smelt aren't thing. there anymore because of pollution I'm... and climate change. Well, yeah. Every summer we go up to Montrose Harbor. Mm. Gerald. Wow. Yeah. This is all right. We'll get into all these references. But, Gerald, what did you think of the story overall? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was nice to, to, to read how how Andy lives. It's uh, have a view of his lifestyle and uh, he wasn't even born yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved the I I, I love the atmosphere it created. I, I loved um, you know, the fact it was a complete story and, and there were great characters, great characterization, really well done. Um, easy to read, even though it was a little bit long, but it didn't it wasn't uh, it wasn't too bad. Um, and I really, really enjoyed it. Awesome. So yeah. Good. Awesome. Yeah. I'm more on the really, really enjoyed it side. I thought it was really good. I thought it had a lot of substance. So I guess we'll dig into that. There was a lot of things and themes that it was exploring. I, I like that it was making me, um, yeah, think about, you know, religion, community myths, hmm. all that kind of stuff, how those things come together. Um, the ending I thought was great. Uh, but it's funny because the first time I tried to read it through, I actually had a hard time getting into it um, because I think I just didn't care about the characters enough. So it took me a while. And then on my second read through, I could sort of breeze through it and, and, and appreciate it a lot more. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's sort of dig into some of those themes because Andy seems to think that they don't exist. So. Yeah. Even though I feel like it's very tightly like the same things keep coming up. Yeah. Because like, um, I guess for you guys, what's the heart of the story if it has one? Like what is like its main kind of like thesis? I, I, I guess I guess for me, it, it would be about about how tight-knit a community is, how how uh, stories are passed down and and how myths are created um and obviously the the sort of religion has a has has an effect on this um but it, but it's really about how tight knit the community are and and how i don't know how 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 they can tell a a great story even though they're they're quite poor and and quite in in, in quite a um, a, a poor area of, of, of the city. So I, I, I enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Andy, anything for you? No. Yeah. No. I mean, the thing I got about it was just the changing city. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. Right. And like people being shuffled around as, as the city changed around them, the, the old things aren't there anymore. Mm. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. the new plexiglass guard towers on county lockup. Yeah, yeah. So definitely the the sort of changing of the city. There's a way in which the way that the city's changing, it's sort of like losing its um, 
sense of community along the way a little bit, right? Yeah. It, there's this feeling of it was always poor, but before things were getting boarded up, when factories were still here, when people were still making pickles and scooping vermin out of vats, it was poor, but there was a, a certain identity, a certain charm within that. Um, and not a complete and total hopelessness, I guess, or I guess there was some dignity in the work where it seems like now, flash forward 30 years, the only fixture they ever talk about is the jail and Buddy's bar. That's it. It's just a jail and a bar. Uh, everything's been shut down. There's no more dill pickle vat vats and people sharpening knives behind billboards. Okay. <laughs> so, right. So the, these things have changed. But the one thing that I think is really interesting is, um, or I guess the thing that I kept thinking about was the sort of need to like sort of canonize or myth make around local legends, right? In the very beginning, everyone knows the story about the ice house girl that was 30 years ago. And then Pancho is always searching for like, well, what about like Roberto Clemente or Mrs. Carrillo who like stood on her knees for days on end, praying for <laughs> the victims of the earthquake in Puerto Rico, which was actually Nicaragua. Remember Manny says it wasn't Puerto Rico. It was yeah. Nicaragua. Cause I looked it up. <laughs> I was like, it's not Puerto Rico. Yeah. But, um, so they're trying to find local saints, local legends. And then Pancho kind of becomes a legend when he disappears and everyone's talking about, you know, what happened to Pancho. And then at the very, very end, the reason I like the ending is because Eddie and Manny, in their own way, try to contribute to the legend, right? They're the disbelievers. They didn't think the Ice House Girl exists. Pancho believed without ever having seen it. By the end of it, they see it, not Pancho. They see that the Ice House Girl exists. And I guess in almost like a owed to Pancho, they like continue to contribute to the legend right now they're inserting themselves in it then it's oh the ice house box was going to be demolished but just before it was demolished these two locals released her into lake michigan now she's floating down lake michigan right you're continuing the legend you're adding to that history um so yeah i like to me the thread of the importance of local local legends sort of bind a community together was the most interesting part of the story for me that's what i liked mm. oh boy yeah, I, and and, yeah. and and I think that 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 sense of the sort of post-industrialization where where you're able to where poor people were able to get jobs and reasonably well-paid jobs and and consistent jobs, and now once the factories shut down, there is nothing for them. There's nothing for for low-skilled workers. Certainly at this time, so it's it's before the the sort of huge outbreak of um, coffee shops and and fast right. fast food joints, um, and, and and so there, there's there's <clears throat> no work for them. There's there's very little for them to do, and and I think, but I think that the author paints a really good picture of of what life is like for them. So I I, I really enjoyed that. What's she doing? Is she hearing us? I don't know. It's a mystery. Hello. What are you doing? Have you stopped? Something happened to Annie's ears. One sec, I can't hear you, she says. <laughs> My headphones went off. One sec. One hmm. sec. We're both reading. But she said one sec twice. So is that two secs or is that just like consecutive? <laughs> It's a bit inconsistent, isn't it? It's uh, yeah, yeah. It's not very clear. I think she needs to be a bit more clear when she. So f smelt. They're these tiny little <sighs> fish, and you have these like just big old huge fine nets that you cast into Lake Michigan as they migrate. Okay. Right. Smelt. And then you just grab them, and uh, basically we just. Uh, you know, smoked them, toasted them. I don't know exactly mm -hmm. what you do. I was a little boy at the time. They stopped coming okay. in because climate change. But yeah, I just had all these like metal trash barrels that you'd start fires in and then like toast the smelt and eat them. Oh, so do, do you have sardines? I mean, they yeah. exist. Yeah. I don't okay. I think those are but, ocean but, fish. I, I yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I'm just thinking of the small fish that, that, yeah. that you have. Yeah, they're oh, like what? sardine sized. Okay, so so sort of you know reasonable, like yeah. you know four inches or something. Yeah, little little man's like here's a smelt, little man's. 
Okay. Because um, I'm still recording this. This is yeah. hilarious. Um, yeah, because have you heard of white bait? I don't know what that is. Okay. White bait is, is tiny, tiny fish that you eat whole. It's it's like, I suppose they're like two inches long. Okay. Quite skinny. And and you you sort of dip them in flour and deep fry them. Um but you just you just shove the whole thing in, which 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 is pretty horrible yeah. when you think about it. But it's it's nice. <laughs> it's strange. Well the um the custom that I was told as a young boy was that the first time you go smelt fishing you have to bite the head off a live fish. Oh really? And I was made to do that. I'm 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 not a fan of if when you if you go out to eat somewhere a fish restaurant they bring you the whole fish like the you know the whole like yeah. foot long fish with a head on it I don't not a great fan of that and I, I and when I watch cooking programs and they put the head back in to make a fish stock right and stuff, yeah. oh no, yeah you know you know what smelts smelts about the same I'd say okay. they're like two biters and not quite a, a one bite okay. But yeah, okay. Well, it's um, a smelt, eh? Interesting. Yeah. And this is a like a freshwater fish, lake yeah. type fish, right? Yeah, freshwater. Right, they Did migrate it. in. Hey, hey, yeah. I, th My I other think they stopped showing up in like the mid nineties. Okay, we're talking about smelts. By the smelts, way. smelts. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Sorry about that. Too many headphones and. <laughs> Not enough time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Gerald, I missed what you were saying after my whole myth-making thing because that's exactly. Oh, what I I know. I've forgotten what I was saying. It's not. It's um, uh, something about community. Yeah, I thought I'd. I yeah, thought I'd done that. But yeah, yeah, I, I liked. I liked. Yeah, it, and it was the post-industrialization. It's it, it's the it's the the sort of breakdown of 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 the working class society of the big factories disappearing uh, and all the jobs that it's, it's a little hobby horse of mine. So all the jobs for the people who aren't highly educated and highly skilled just disappear and there's nothing to, to replace them. Um, and, uh, and so people have got just nothing to do and no way of earning money, which is, you know, it's, it's tough. It's, it must be, well, I don't know what it is. It must be tough though. I would mm -hmm. guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they never say why exactly Poncho went to jail, but I'm guessing it's selling drugs, right? He was in well, the gang. right. Yeah, they referenced yeah. he was drug dealing a few times. Yeah, and he he kept getting caught, but not getting caught. And I imagine mm -hmm. one time he got caught. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, yeah. And also, there's like a lot of hints to what well, happened twice. Um, the story of the ice house girl. The way the story's told, it's she is at threat of sexual violence, but. It's not confirmed that it happens, but you can kind of read between the lines. And also Poncho freaking out at the jail whenever he does meet Manny. There's a threat of sexual violence, but not the confirmation of it, which I thought was interesting because he also becomes a legend in a way. Right. Um, yeah. Something I only caught like the second time through. But yeah, just. Mm. Uh, yeah. I don't think it's a main point. I don't even know if it was conscious, but. Um, yeah. So. uh what about the way that the author breaks up the story into these subsections with these section titles? Is that something, because we don't see that too often, even in longer stories. Do you guys like it? Do you think it offered any clues? I feel like each section title was like, here's the theme we're exploring. Yeah. Yeah. Um, didn't really make much difference to me. I don't think I just, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, if you want to do that, great. If you don't, right. Don't. Like, I don't know. The themes were pretty, <clears throat> clear from the sections yeah. also it wasn't it wasn't like but that's that's interesting you say that andy because you were saying that you felt there was no substance but now you're saying the substance is self-evident right yeah ah. just not very deep or meaningful why do you think it's not very deep like what's missing for for you um i don't know do i feel like it's a story about the city more than it's a story about the characters and yeah, I can. I think that's kind of it. It's a story about the city more than it's a story about the characters. And 
I don't know. The city's huge. It's easy to write a story about the city. Write a story about some characters. I guess. I mean, we've we've read stories here before where it's about a place or a thing, and not necessarily the character. Because I know what you're saying. We're like, yeah. Well, it's, like this city specifically. I don't know. Like it fucking. It lends itself well to having a story made of it. Like it's all of this stuff was pre-made, right? Like, oh, and then the ice house gets demolished. Like, yeah, the ice house got demolished because right, the stockyards were closing down and the whole character of the city was changing. Like it's right, but he's observing something about the way that the character of the city is changing that doesn't tie it only to the infrastructure changes and the economic changes that are happening he's tying it to how does a, a how does a people's sense of community change right how how does the external and the internal play into each other right yeah. that's why there's this need to sort of have your local myths and legends um so th- that's why the saints in the ice house that's about to get demolished yes of course the ice house is going to get demolished and if there's no saint in it yeah who cares <laughs> but <laughs> You know, this is this is like one of the few because remember there's also that line in the story about how their memory of the place only extends as far back as their fathers, not even their grandfathers. Right. right. There's this feeling of like nothing everything's sort of like lost, even as you're losing even as there's um physical changes happening around you, the internal change, it's like all of that's being demolished too. There's no preservation of any history or anything here. And I think that's what's being mourned as well in this story. Like what are we losing in terms of our sense of selves as a people, not just the ice house or I don't know why the deal pickle vat stuck out to me. I guess because everyone knows you're getting vermin out of there and you're still eating it. Guys, like, please stop eating these pickles. Oh, these open vats. Well, yeah. someone puts worms in tequila. What's that? About? But that's, that's different. Is this? That's okay. The, it is. Yeah. That's the point. You can buy a tequila with a worm in it. No one's like, let me sell you a jar of pickles with a worm in it, because that's the fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Here's rat yeah, brand I, 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 pickles. And, and I think also the, 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 the fact, because the, the, the author's um, highlighting the changes, but also through Poncho going to prison and then disappearing and then becoming a myth so it, it's it's like i think i thought it was quite big could, could because the 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 girl was part of the myth and there were lots mm-hmm. of myths but pancho himself became a myth because not only did he go to prison but then he just disappeared so it, it's it's i th- and and they sort of mourn his loss too uh the sort of you know, tight-knit little group and and the group starts to fall apart um over time and pancho was a bit of a living myth even before he disappeared right like of the three of them who sticks out the most it's the guy like that's covered in rosaries who has matching sneakers to his different altar boy outfits depending on where you are in the liturgical calendar who you know believes in guardian angels and pretty much anything astrology ghosts everything who wants like people around them to be canonized um and then he says he wants to pose for the holy cards, right? You know, like the I call the yeah. Catholic trading cards, like the little like, like Pokemon Catholic cards for Catholics. Cards. Yeah, like, well, <laughs> cards I mean, for Catholics. I know I, I'm saying this dismissively, so I feel like I should say, growing up Catholic, I have a bunch of these in my wallet because my grandma's given them to me. So like, your yeah. grandma's give these to you, you feel bad throwing them out, so they just exist in your wallet forever. So I have a few, you know. Got a couple of Judas in there. I got a Lazarus. So Ooh. just saying, if you want to trade. Have you tried them? Is it just, are I mean, any more I feel like. Than others? If you got two I Judases and someone else has a St. Peter. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I could trade a Judas for a Peter. Yeah. But um, so, you know, remember when when the, when the he's being sentenced and the um, there's, there's two interesting things that happen there, right? Because Pancho is like the most religious one, the one who's already, he stands out. He's also in a gang, um, and when he's being sentenced, like you can either join the military and go to war, or you can go to jail. And he, you know, he's like, "I'm already a captain." He means a captain in his gang. <laughs> like, yes. He's, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, and that yeah, that's when he says he wants to pose for the holy cards. So yeah, Pancho is a bit of a legend already, even in, in life, and then more so when he just disappears, right? Mm. Pancho was my favorite of the three, just because yep. he did the most stuff. <laughs> right. Well, right. He yeah. was the one that was a character. Sick, sick burn. 
and Eddie. Wow, all right. You know, Andy, you're saying that this was a story about the city instead of the characters. And to that, I think both the author and the city of Chicago would agree because in 2004, um, this, so this is from an anthology called The Coast of Chicago. And um, by the way, the story won the O'Henry Award for short fiction. And I think two other stories from that same anthology by Dybeck won the award sure, as well. The Owen Henry Award, whatever that's yeah. worth. <laughs> oh, and uh mean. yeah and um anyway so the coast of chicago the anthology was chosen for the city's one book one chicago program which encouraged not just students but all citizens to discuss citywide like a book club so yes the city of chicago would agree that this is about yeah. chicago and so is the whole anthology That's well the point. right okay sure but like it's a pre-made awesome character to write your short story about like i don't know i'm not saying he's a hack but he's not a hack because he no did i'm not it. saying he's a hack but like yeah. also this was the easy one i don't know no it wasn't you can say that about any major city so what every story that's about new york now is <laughs> like no but like if you want it to stand out do a something special <laughs> i think like... it is special because of the saint you have your local saint there's all kinds of local saints. I got a bunch of local saints. <laughs> I guess that's what strikes me about the story, honestly, more than anything else. It's, it's feels so true to my lived experience. I'm like, okay, so was this Tuesday? That's funny that you say that because we've read stories on this podcast, most by mostly by Juno Diaz and one other, that was like, oh, this is my lived experience. Like I think yeah. in, there was a Juno Diaz short story where he literally referenced Mitsua. Where I was like, oh, a place to hang out at all the time as a teenager. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, but for me, it was exhilarating. It was thrilling to see not other people's stories. I, you know, what I call like, you know, people in New England in gardens, right? Like not right. that, but my story captured yeah. and I liked it. Well, I guess I enjoyed reading it, right? Like my bush is buried at St. Adelbert's. Hmm. So the, uh, both the word Busha and St. Adelbert's were name checked. There you but go. I enjoyed reading it, but I don't think I enjoyed it as a story. This is that a relevant distinction? That's the part I like. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is like my thing. Oh, oh, my dad does that. Oh. Uh, but then like I got to the end and I was like, eh. <laughs> is it because you feel like it's too mundane? Because to you, you're just like, oh. All right, right. Okay. a little bit. People have bushes. Yeah, people have bushes. That's funny, because for me, when I read like a Juno Diaz story that's like getting real close to my lived experience, I'm like, oh, other people get to learn about this now, too. It's yeah. exciting that it exists. Everyone could learn about it. You just have to live my exact life. That's all. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. Not many stories are written about Birmingham in the UK in the mid seventies, <laughs> which is my lived experience. So I'm waiting for one of those. Let's find so I can... it. Yeah, yeah. Good luck with that. I'm sure it exists. <laughs> well, I maybe. guess really though, this was a story about my dad's lived experience, right? Because I was, yeah, grew up yeah. in the suburbs of Chicago in the late eighties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, yeah. the author Stuart Dybeck is one of yours, Andy, because yeah. he. Yeah, Polish family, Chicago neighborhood, similar well, to the one in the story. Yeah, no, obviously. Catholic grammar. That. Okay, yeah. yeah. So. Oh, I thought you meant like he was from my school. I like, I don't know exactly what I thought you meant. He like, might have been. Right. I don't know. Let's look it up. Probably. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there's obviously. Only, Stuart there's Dybeck only one, isn't there? Polish Catholic from Chicago. Yeah. You, yeah, have, yeah, you yeah. have one school, don't you? So that's it. That's cool. that it it's a tiny city, tiny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did you get triggered? Did I trigger you, Andy? <laughs> oh yeah, he did go to my school, huh? No, he did? my college. Oh, okay, yeah, Loyola. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then. Well, there's more Catholic universities in Chicago than just Loyola. Okay. okay. Let's be clear. <laughs> there's there's options. <laughs> Okay, so we talked a bit about um, Eddie, Manny, and Poncho, mostly Poncho, that we liked Poncho the most. Um, oh. But so I think this is where I have to agree with Andy a little bit more, though I've been fighting him this whole episode, which is I do think Eddie and Manny kind of feel like shoe-ins for just any Eddie and Manny, right? 
But I yeah. think that's the point. Again, I think that's intentional. I think there's a reason they're the two that sort of survive the length of the story and Pancho's gone. Pancho's, like, like I said, the one who actually feels unique and particular, where I think it's intentional for Eddie and Manny to stand for any Polish and Hispanic uh, immigrant in Southside. Well, uh, not even immigrant. They're born here, but right. uh, from those families. Yeah, in Southside Chicago. Well, like they're probably the like point. second generation, like re- recent immigrant family. Mm-hmm, yeah. Second or third, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Maybe second for Manny, third for Eddie. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Manny's got a busha or Eddie's got a busha. Mm-hmm. Can I ask what's a busha? Busha is, uh, it, it does not mean grandmother in Polish. Babcha would mean grandmother in Polish. Busha is for some reason what Polish people, Polish immigrants in America call their grandmother. It's like a specific thing. Like if you go to Poland, nobody knows what you're talking about. So it's a Polish American thing. Right. It's a Polish American thing. Ah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Chicago also, I don't know if this statistic is true, but this was true growing up at least. Uh, demographics change over the years. But Chicago had the largest population of Polish people of any city in the world except for Warsaw. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So that's every other city in Poland included. Yeah. It's amazing. Jeez. You so, good then. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gerald, what did you think of the prose and the voice, the author, like getting into craft a bit? Yeah, yeah. It it it's it's my it's my sort of writing. It's it's mm-hmm. it's very down to earth, it's very practical, that it's very I mean, beautiful descriptions, really, really um, good quality descriptive writing. Um, and, yeah, there's just so many, so many lovely bits. You know, from from there, they could stare down 26th, five dark blocks, then an explosion of neon at Kedzie Avenue, Taco Places bars, a street plugged in, winking festive as a pinball machine. I mean, lo- lovely, lovely lines like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed the read. You know, even though it's 11,500 words, it, it's, it just devoured it. It was, um, it was very, very nice. Hmm. Yeah. What about you, Eddie? You called it pretentious at the start of the podcast. Yeah, no. Uh, not in tone, I guess. I don't know. In, mm-hmm. in aim. I, I felt like it was pointed at something else and then never got there so like i don't know don't, don't maybe you were wrong there. about where it was pointing because i feel like it got exactly where it was pointing yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. is it because it started with the saint so if it started with the saint you weren't sure how it got to just talking about the changes in chicago's communities uh, not even really like that f- with everything like that's not out of character with changes in chicago's communities you know like that Mm -hmm. yeah i'm on board with yeah i suppose i don't i don't know exactly something about the language i didn't care for Mm -hmm. like not that i didn't care for but like i don't know what was it trying to do yeah, I liked it, but I did feel sometimes, and I don't even know how to describe this yet. So maybe I should figure that out before a recording. Yeah, um, which is there was something about the way that w- that was written that felt distinctly because this story was published in eighty four, right? That felt there was something about it that was just like I don't know, like it fit with a kind of writing that felt to me masculine and sort of like more like mid century ish, I guess like 50 and 60s ish like i just i feel like if the story was written by a modern author now in chicago same story same characters the language it would be like like the language was both sparse but li- but i don't know not really sparse it wasn't actually sparse it was like mm. the way that he would weave certain subjects together within the same sentence without breaking it up yeah. felt like something we don't do as much anymore like there were there was a little bit more like um 
play between like subjects within the same sentence in a way that I think our modern brains are a little less accustomed to. We normally break them out into separate sentences. I feel like I need to do a side by side of what I'm talking about. But I, I remember a few sentences where I had to read over and I was like, why did why did it take my brain a second to like connect these things? I don't know how to explain it, but maybe you guys, I feel like I should have highlighted one. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just sort of looking through now and I, and I think there are occasions when the sentences were long. I mean, I found I found one here um, talking about the ice house. It was a special building the kind of child couldn't help but notice and remember. There on the hyphen, there on the corner across the street from the prison, a factory that made ice, humming with fans, its louvered roof dripping and clacking, lost in acrid clouds of its own escaping vapor. So it's quite a long sentence, and I think modern short story writers would have split that mm -hmm. af after the kind of the kind of child couldn't help but notice and remember and then start a new sentence um mm -hmm. so yeah i think i think that's um I, th I, can, I can see what you mean by that and even in a shorter sentence i remember there was one with victory gardens that tripped me up which was um so did the victory gardens that had become weed beds taking the corroded plaques with the names of the neighborhood dead with them so up until so did the victory gardens that had become weed beds, real simple. And then taking the corroded plaques with the names of the neighborhood dead with them is bringing in a whole other sort of like visual into the brain and a whole other point in the same sentence that I, I had to read it twice before I understood what he was saying. There's a few of those. And it's not a long sentence, but it's like what he's trying to do with those like two halves of that sentence. I don't know. There was something about that that made me think of slightly older authors. And it just struck me that we don't do this anymore. And it makes me wonder, are we becoming less literate? Or is it better to not do that? I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, there's a. I was just looking for for Victory Garden. There's another reference to it um, where it says, "And seeing it, Big Antec suddenly remembered a moment from his first summer back from the Pacific, comma discharged from the hospital in Manila and back in Buddy's Lounge on Twenty Fourth Street, Kitty Corner from a Victory Garden where a plaque erroneously listed his name among the poet parish war dead." So there's there's, and that's fifty words in that sentence. That's quite a long sentence. That's quite a a sort of old fashioned, like you know, uh, 19th century almost way of, of writing with big, long language sentences, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of unusual, but but also kind of nice. <clears throat> yeah, among the parish war dead. That's an old timey way. To right. Name. Yeah. yeah. That's like an old phrasing, right? Yeah. Among the war parish dead. So I did notice that as I was reading it, there was a part of me that's like, is my brain just like deeply shaped by modern writing that I'm like struggling, right? It's like when you do read really old writing, you're, it takes you a while to relearn how people used to write and presumably speak back then, maybe. But <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, not a bad thing. I'm not knocking the story for it. It's just something that I had noticed. Yeah, no, I, I think that it. is what I'm knocking the story for, though. Uh, that's what you don't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm that... not knocking the story for it. Yeah. I guess not in and of itself, but I don't know. It didn't do anything with its mm -hmm. old timey language to make me. I liked it. Well, yeah, yeah. It took I, a little while. I think. Yeah, I think because it it wasn't flowery. The thing that differentiates differentiates itself from old timey language is is that everything in the sentence does a job there's no extra floweriness or or sort of randomness mm -hmm. um i mean there's, there's looking at one here that's 146 words long uh and it's it just describes everything really well there's one semicolon in the middle but but everything is really it's it's like it was meant to be that right length. right it's not specific it's not very purple it's just like long yeah, it's long, but that's. I feel like it requires a certain flexibility in your um, reading brain. Yeah. Right. Mm. You have to like hold things at the same time because in a long sentence you'll like refer back to a thing that was like several, right? And that's older writing is like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, My yeah. best friends in high school were named Eddie and Manny. So are you Poncho? <laughs> yeah, sort of. I was Poncho. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I was the one that was the altar boy. Well, did you match your uh, your your shoes to the? No, nah, I didn't match my shoes. A little Okay, calendar. well, I guess you didn't take it very seriously. Yeah. Well, I also didn't end up in twenty six in California. 
True. True, true. Okay, so are we ready to rate it? Yeah. 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 It's a five from me. Ooh. It's a five for me, too. It's a four for me. Okay. okay. Higher yeah. than I thought you would give it. So well, yes. I enjoyed reading it. I don't want to discount that. And if that's the stand, if if I can rate down very good stories because I didn't like reading them, then this story that I don't think is all that good, I can rate up because I enjoyed it. Okay. Oh. I would have given it a three had it I been about been, any I, other I, city. I would have given it more because the first time through on the last sentence when it they were it, it showed um, Eddie and Manny shining the sweat the girl already, met, already melting between them and they forced themselves faster rowing like a couple of sailors and I thought ah, it was them that did it oh wow that's fantastic what? and then when I, well then when I read it again I, I realized that she it was from years before but I got very excited because I thought that's a nice ending. She thought it was a plot and twist, is, though. And, and it is, yeah, and it is quite a nice ending um, because it does have that reference back to the start with with the the, the guys taking her out, the potential sailors mm -hmm. taking her out, and so, they're doing um, it for a very different reason, and they're asserting yeah. themselves in the legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. So, Gerald, what are yes. we reading next week? Next week, we are reading the Interlopers by. H. H. Munro, or also known as Saki, for some reason. Okay, cool. All right. But before you go, tell us about your local myths and legends in our Facebook discussion group, Literary Roadhouse Readers. And our podcast is a legend in the making. You can help it by leaving a review on iTunes and supporting our podcast expenses on patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. As always, share this podcast with the girls trapped in ice in your life. Until next time, read a good story. Hey, Andy.